So uh, normally we do question and answer session in three rounds, but we have one uh, very prominent speaker today, so we'll do just one question and one answer as we go. And I'll help choose the uh, questions as you may not be able to see all of them. So um, I'm sure people will be eager to start asking, and I'll go from side to side and also take into account our virtual audience as we're live streaming this event. So opening the floor for questions from Michael. Okay, we'll start over here. If you could introduce yourself. And Gary Bittner with USAID. Really uh, appreciate your overview of this chronic problem with malnutrition and other areas. And uh, I was fascinated by earlier in your comment, you, men you mentioned something about political policies and systems and that they need to change. And then I was looking at uh, hearing you saying, you know, how do you make decisions on old data? Financially, would we do that? Businesses, of course, probably would not. But uh, my question is, how rapidly do our systems change? So, so if we're collecting data on malnutrition or something in the community or family and looking at the value chain of that food source, mm. how quickly does it change? Do you have any information on systems change and how rapidly it, how rapidly it changes? So I can would you know anything about that? Can I just clarify, when you say how rapidly it changes, do you mean how rapidly demographic data on nutrition changes or how rapidly policies and systems change? Uh, the latter part. Mainly. Right, yeah. But if you want to address the other one as well, it's okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't think there's a single answer to that, to be honest. Um, it's you know incredibly frustrating that policy often changes very, very slowly. Um, I think one of the interesting things is sometimes there can be huge change without a change in policy. I think the experience of Maharashtra over the last decade is really important because it was a place where basically people got on with doing things that they were already charged with doing. Um, a small amount of political leadership, but mainly amount of leadership at the official level to get people in post, track what they were doing, get on with it, and they, they have stunting. Um, and, you know, just a remarkable achievement without actually huge policy change, but a fundamental attention to delivery. Um, I suppose I have a personal uh, prejudice, Gary, which is I think that the development community as a whole, we tend to overvalue innovation and undervalue execution. Um, just getting on with executing things that are well known, we know what the answers are, really, really makes a big difference much of the time. And you know, in my life, I spend a lot of my time talking to philanthropists, and most philanthropists coming into development new, they all, not all, but by and large, they start with the idea of, I'm gonna help in create the new innovation which is gonna solve everything that no one's ever worked out before. I wish it were so easy. An awful lot of it is just the grinding hard business of working through what needs to be done. And um, so new policies help, but we can do an awful lot by changing systems and implementation. I think data is unparalleled in its ability to do that. One more from this side of the room. Hi, Liz Buckingham from the Office of Global Food Security at the State Department. Really good lecture. Thank you. Very thought-provoking. I have a question. I know a lot of us in the room are thinking through the sustainable development goals and how to best use the opportunity of the post-15 development agenda. Um, and you spoke of the data revolution, which we're all kind of grappling with. And I guess my question is the kind of theory that I'm following is that if we get the nutrition targets and indicators that we want into the post-2015 development agenda, either as indicators or targets, that the data will follow. That if it's there, there's going to be renewed attention, the data will come. I think that's a little bit of a fallacy. We can look at the MDGs and see where there are still data gaps, but that at least is the approach that we're trying to take. Should we be taking a different approach? Should we be, does data not follow the post-MDGs? Should data come before we get into the post-MDGs? So just your thoughts on that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really important question. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Lawrence Haddad has just written a really good piece about what what are the things that ought to go into the post-2015 framework? 
basically he's arguing that the WHA targets mainly need to go in with a few other pieces here and there. I guess my view is, you know, it's great if the SDGs reflect nutrition broadly, but we already have the WHA targets. I, that's enough to be getting on with. We need, though, we need to fill those data gaps. And whether the SDGs are an incredible success or a complete flop failure doesn't really matter because we have these targets to work with. Let's create the data to track that. And I don't think we need to, I mean, obviously we want good targets uh, we want, and good indicators, and we should try to get them. But I, again, my, my own personal prejudice is we perhaps have spent a wee bit too much time obsessing about the SDGs when we actually need to know what to do and we should get on with it. Um, I think there is a real choice about the SDGs, and I say this as kind of having thought about the whole framework from a different position. Every community wants to have all of their targets in the SDGs. Um, you know, I, in addition to nutrition, my foundation runs programs on education, on infant health care, um, on HIV, on adolescence, on climate change. Every single group wants to have lots and lots of targets in the SDGs. My worry is that if you get a long laundry list that covers everything that everyone wants, you'll just lose attention. So for my money, it's better to have a small number of really compelling, powerful targets in the SDGs, which will really move people, which will create political will, mobilize resources, focus attention on a small number of things, and then we can build out with other targets elsewhere. Um, and I think we have the WHA targets, for example. We should build on them and continue to build on that, that momentum. You, but you know, what's really important is these, this da these data gaps aren't going to just fill themselves, even if they are in the SDGs. It will be up to the World Bank and UNICEF and the bilateral donors and IFPRI and all the governments to fill those data gaps. And that's just a lot of slogging hard work. And we, <laughs> unfortunately, we're just going to have to get on with it. Um, and make sure the funding is there and the political will is there to do it. Uh, but we certainly should not wait as long. Some of the MDGs were allowed to have data gaps for a long time, much longer than was conscionable. So uh, uh, Liz, you're in a great place to help drive this. I invite you to um, call us together and make sure we're doing it. Thank you. All right. Uh, howdy and then... Hi, Howdy Buis from Harvest Plus. Uh, following on Schengen's remarks, I can't resist the opportunity to say that uh, Harvest Plus was, uh, the idea got started with a grant from USAID Nutrition, which was then in the Agricultural Department. It's since migrated to health. And just to connect it to Michael, uh, three years ago on his watch at DFID, uh, DFID became the largest donor to Harvest Plus and continues to be. So thank you for that. Thank you for emphasizing the data. Um, I think the next uh, difficult questions then are, who's going to pay for collecting the data? What is it going to cost? Um, uh, a country that I know well, the Philippines, has been doing a national nutrition survey for once every five years ever since I joined IFBRI, so that's been a long time. Um, getting access to the data. So the, the, one of the conclusions is national governments will probably be the ones to pay for a lot of the data collection. Then getting access to the data. It would be wonderful to be able to get into those data sets, compare them across years, but it's very uh, uh, politically sensitive. It's very difficult to get access to the data. And then, of course, you always want them to collect other data so you can, you can connect the economic variables to the nutrition data and so how to get them to expand their surveys, which, of course, costs more money. Thanks, Howdy. Um, I, I have to say, Harvest Plus has done a great job, a real good example of an organization that has paid attention to what's the coverage, what's the impact, how much of a difference are you making, and I really applaud the work you've done. It's set a good example for others. Um, so who's going to pay for the data? I think there has to be a mix. Of the, the, the most important parts of the data are going to have to be paid for by national governments as part of their sovereign responsibilities. But it is right that they should choose for themselves what are the date, what's the data they want to collect. I, I, it couldn't be otherwise. But on top of that, I think there's a global public goods dimension whereby 
you know, the big donors in particular have a responsibility to help pay for the collection and collation and dissemination of some of this data as part of a global public goods um, package. So I think, I think it is both. I think there is a real challenge about the politics and the transparency of data. Um, data that is not transparent is not going to have much impact. It's, it, and I think there is, you know, in another lecture I would talk about the global transparency movement. I think there is a, there's a big push to get more transparency on, on data of all kinds around the world. I think that is part of the journey we need to be on collectively. Um, initiatives like the um, IATI, um, International Aid Transparency Initiative, the Open Government Partnership, um, the new Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the World Wide Web, he's created this charter for the web about how the web should be transparent. Um, then G8 adopted new data standards on when data is produced, not just put it in PDF files, but put it in machine-readable formats. So all of the G8 countries are rolling that out gradually across all government data. So, you know, collectively we need to continue to advance that because unless the data is transparent and accessible, we can't use it. My personal bugbear at the moment is um, International Energy Agency data, which compares, um, which is mainly about uh, commercial oil and coal prices and so on, and usage. Most of that is not available to non-fossil um, fuel companies, which is a staggering thing. If we want to, keep, anyway, it's not about nutrition. I'm going down a, a different path. My point is that I think that there is a global tendency towards more transparency, and we need to do everything we can to continue to move that along. And on nutrition, we can collectively. There's a lot of leadership in this room. And we can collectively make the case. I do think we, one additional place we can provide some help is coming up with a fairly small number of common things that everyone will want to measure that are really very good proxy indicators. What we don't want to do is have mountains and mountains of huge numbers of data sets that uh, we, want, we want to measure a small number of things will make the single biggest difference. And I think we could show leadership on that. Um, but the original question, payment, I think it's both national governments and the international community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mira Shaker from the World Bank. Thank you, Michael. That was fabulous, really. Um, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit, if I may, with your permission. Uh, um, your thesis t seems to suggest, correct me if I'm wrong, that if we had more data, action would follow, that, that action is driven primarily by data. I know, unfortunately, far too many countries where there's plenty of data but no action. And I'm wondering if another pitch may be to do what is starting to happen in other sectors where we link data to action, mm -hmm. help the uh, results-based financing, for example. You cannot put in place a results-based financing program without data to verify whether things have been done. And because data are linked uh, to financing, people getting paid for services that they are supposed to deliver, they create the data as well. So therein we make a difference in the system and we put in place a virtuous cycle. So I, I wanted to push you in, in, in um, um, that direction. If, I needed to, though you were the father of, of health results innovation trust. Well, thanks, Mira. I, it wouldn't be a conversation with you, Mira, unless you challenged me on something, so I'm, I'm fairly relieved. Um, <laughs> no, it, um, I really welcome that. Look, I, I'm a huge fan of results-based financing. I'm slightly worried that we th think it's a magic bullet um, and they're not, it can't do everything. but. I guess what I was trying to say in my talk was that data alone is not the point. The, point, uh, the whole point about a KPI, this no idea about numbers with attitude or numbers with a hard edge, is that it's data linked to action. And that's why I guess I'm trying to say let's have a business sort of business-like approach to this, which is you don't, ju don't just produce the numbers, you find ways of getting it in front of people, in front of leaders and decision makers and so on. And 
results-based financing is a terrific way to do that. Um, and I'm a real fan of the things that the World Bank and, and others have done on that front. Uh, that said, I think there are systemic things that are not always going to be amenable to results-based financing solutions. So it is a really important tool in the toolbox. Let's do it. Absolutely. At CIF, we are great fans of results-based financing. I think we've just launched the first development impact bond, uh, which is actually in the education sector uh, rather than nutrition, but we're really interested in doing that nutrition as well. And yet, there will be systemic issues which we'll have to address separately. Thank you. More questions? We'll take one right there. Um, thanks. I'm Paul Eisenman, uh, independent consultant on uh, global programs. Um, again, that was uh, really, really good, Michael. Uh, but I want to follow up on what Mira asked you. Um, let's leave aside results-based financing. Sure. Can you say a few words about what you see on the political economy of moving from good data to having that data used to make big changes and the political economy uh, at the country level, but also the political economy among donors and within <coughs> and with the global nutrition community, so that there can be a move toward the greater cost effectiveness that you talked about. And you certainly implied that there are a lot of programs that had some low value added stuff in them. So yeah. How can we move? Gosh, Paul, thanks for an easy question. Um, Political economy is just the hardest part of all of this, isn't it? Um, you know, I had a really good meeting with a minister in a sub-Saharan African country, a very honest meeting, aided by several glasses of wine, in which um, he acknowledged that their subsidy program for maize was contributing to overproduction of maize and a loss of dietary diversity in the country and a kind of real recognition that this was contributing to poor nutritional outcomes and there with the help of some donors he had some pretty good data to show that that was the case and the data was in front of him in a usable format but it wasn't going to shift the political position on the subsidies for maize because politically it was too important to keep the subsidies going. Um, another, yeah. So that, there are other anecdotes like that where all the data doesn't doesn't shift it. Another one for me, just being uh, being honest, I live in the United Kingdom, um, where we have the lowest exclusive breastfeeding rates in all of Europe. And this is tracked closely. We have really, really good data on how dreadful our breastfeeding rates are. We know it inside and out. And this has gone up to ministers, it's gone to the National Health Service. It is really deeply understood that the UK is a laggard on breastfeeding, on exclusive breastfeeding. And yet, it's not moving. There's some wailing and gnashing of teeth about how we must take some action, especially in some of the medical journals. But at the political level, I mean, to be absolutely honest, I'm not sure exactly what the political equations are, but it is something around we don't want to be a nanny state and lecture to mums, especially working mums, what their practice have to be. I'm not sure exactly what it is, to be honest, but there is something there, which is a, despite how good the data is, the politics aren't moving. You know, it just, as, as Max Weber said, politics is the very slow boring of very thick planks, and it takes time. You just make the case, and the data helps make the case. And without the data, you can't make it powerfully. There are some good counterexamples. If you think of the cash transfer, the conditional cash transfer programs in places like Mexico and Brazil, it was because they monitored them closely and showed real impact, they could build strong political support for them. So... <laughs> this is a cop-out, Paul, but I think you know data sometimes can really help shift the politics, and sometimes it's not enough. And sometimes we may just have to keep at it for years and years until it does move. But it can help. Back to the room there. 
I am Catherine Williams from Evidence Action. Um, I appreciated your mention that nutrition is a multi-sector issue, um, as it certainly has so many links to economic productivity and educational outcomes, infectious disease. Um, so my question is, how can we not only ensure greater transparency in nutrition data, but also kind of use nutrition data to provide kind of some energy for more productive partnerships that also address these complementary areas of development? Which do you have in mind, Catherine? I'm just thinking about educational outcomes and um, particularly thinking about deworming programs or thinking about um, other interventions that are focusing on nutritional outcomes, but also that look kind of towards more longitudinal outcomes like maybe adult earnings or um, other areas of productivity in life that are also important to holistic health. Okay, so uh, thank you for the question. I, so truth in advertising, CIF is a big funder of evidence action on deworming, so I have to be uh, honest about that. I really interested in finding multi-sectoral ways of delivering. Um, and, you know, it is <laughs> the endless complaint of ministers that we're trying to deliver 18 things and you're coming to fund just one of them and Joe Bloggs over there is coming to fund another one and how are we going to make all these work together? As a community, we have to get a lot better. But we also have to get better at finding innovative ways to bring those links. Yeah, that's why I talked about women at antenatal clinics. How do we identify them? Um, and women at antenatal clinics, by the way, we should be identifying them for deworming as well as for a bunch of other things, um, for example. We have a pilot that we are doing at the moment <clears throat> on uh, seasonal malaria prophylaxis um, and connecting that with some of the nutrition programs and some of the broader health programs we're doing, hoping that the, com the package of things together will make a bigger difference than any of these interventions alone. The additive nature of those interventions um, is often assumed but not yet demonstrated. So, you know, in the fine tradition of evidence action, we should be measuring it to see if it is making a big difference or not. One of the things I've been struck by is we and others have funded programs where um, hand washing is combined with other interventions and surprisingly find that hand washing sometimes doesn't make any difference. Um, but it's worth, it's worth knowing that to see if it's worth combining. So the, my, my main answer to your question is let's empower the delivery, the people at the front line delivery, because they, they see all these problems together. And we too often just equip them to deal with HIV or just equip them to deal with malaria or just equip them to deal with nutrition. And having a stronger sense of what is the full range of things they're dealing with, making sure they have the right resources, the right information, the right tools at their disposal, I, that would just move things enormously. For those of us who implement programs, we've got a long way to go before we are in a good place to support that, but it should be a strong aspiration. And I look to forward to uh, having evidence action help lead some of that. Thank you. Question here. Thank you for a wonderful speech. Um, I am Alina Zyskowski from Global Development Network. And uh, I was here last week for the Global Nutrition Report launch and was uh, very interested in the remarks of, by Jurgen Vogela, the um, World Bank Global Practice Head for uh, Agriculture. And one of the things he said that was I thought was very interesting uh, was that he believed that the data was getting worse instead of better and that the data was, wor was better 20 years ago. Uh, and that, um, and since uh, my organization works very much on data issues with researchers in developing countries, uh, that I was uh, disturbed about that. I wondered if you had the same opinion and if you uh, had any thoughts about that. Because I'm not sure exactly what Jurgen was referring to. Um, I th you know, there are clearly data sets that have deteriorated because funding channels have disappeared or attention has been moved elsewhere. Um, one of the areas we work on is HIV. And you know, there was a huge push on HIV 10 years ago. It's kind of dropped off the agenda in a lot of countries a bit, even though the burden, overall mor morbidity and mortality burden is still high. 
And so we see that in some of the countries we're working in, the quality of the data we have on HIV is deteriorating just because it doesn't have quite the same level of political attention. So international funders are part of the problem because we go through fads um, and fashions. I do think, though, that the transaction costs for generating a lot of data are going down. And so there are places where the data in general, by and large, is getting better. I also think that the overall level of literacy about data or numeracy about data is a lot better. I think the community is, is growing and it's more diverse. And it's partly because data is becoming so deeply imbricated in everyday life and in business. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what Jürgen was talking about. I'm sure he was right because he's very careful in his thinking. Um, but I think it, it's kind of some losses in some places, but some advances in others. But on nutrition, our job is just really straightforward. Let's make sure that we're paying attention to it. And one of my action points is let's have a pooled way of getting together some of the uh, funding and key things like coverage data. Other questions on this side? Not, I'll go back over to this side. There's one in the back or no? Hi, my name is Simone Passarelli, and I'm here with IFPRI. Um, I wanted to bring up your point that uh, we overvalue innovation and undervalue execution, which I think is a really good point. I certainly agree with you. Um, but here at um, a research institute, it stings a little because we really like innovation. And I just wanted to ask your opinion on what we can do as researchers to better contribute to that execution side. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. It's a great question, and it has a really simple answer, which is innovate about execution. Um, <laughs> it, it, there's lots and lots of operations research we could all do to make sure that we are innovating on execution. I, my personal belief is that 25 years from now, we will look back at this time as the time when we were just beginning to ramp up the efforts on innovating on execution. And most of the mo really interesting innovations are going to be in the execution space. Um, so keep, keep at it. That's. Thank you. Any other questions? John? McDermott from IFPRI. I'm the leader of the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program. Um, you talked about using business metrics from you know, using KPIs. And we just talked about execution. Is there anything more we can learn, A, from business that could be adopted by other actors, either civil society or the public sector, or things that we must do together with the private sector? It seems that we're not making a lot of progress in public-private partnerships, probably to the extent that we should. Well, I, I, thinking about how to improve the quality of public-private partnerships on nutrition is a really um, important agenda. I, I think you're right that we haven't found the ways of the read across and the partnership as strongly as we should. And you also sense from a lot of business leaders, they're also frustrated because they would like to find ways of partnering better. Um, so some of the things that could be adopted, obviously basic things like marketing techniques, stronger um, performance measures on delivery, one thing we don't do in the public sector, which you know may be politically too hard, but you know, I talked about marketing departments in big companies. Marketing departments are driven by bonuses. And it's all about, do you deliver the targets or not? And that doesn't apply to everything in the public sector, but there's very little bonus-driven work in the public sector. It's a, you know, the, and the service ethos, I'm a huge believer in the service ethos. It has to be treasured and looked after. But there are times in some places, some parts of the delivery chain, where we could be a bit more hard-edged about, well, let's measure whether we're meeting our targets and reward people for it. So that's the kind of thing. On the broader collaboration on nutrition between um, public and private sector, Paul Pullman, head of Unilever, has put forward the proposition that it's, it's much easier for business to work on nutrition if it's not forced to work on the first thousand days. Um, and I think he's probably right. I, we, we, I, we are really focused the first thousand days. We really care about it. We really want to make a difference there. But it may be that the best way to get business more involved is 
helping with the nutrition of women of childbearing age, for example, rather than trying to focus on those um, more public healthy type interventions. So it may be that those of us who work from the public sector should be a bit more forgiving in the kind of targets that we're looking for and be a bit more flexible in trying to find where the places businesses really can contribute. That probably wasn't your real question, but I wanted to say it. 